Hi, I'm Tony Russo, and this is A Bagel Manifesto, where I share stories about coming to terms with belief, culture, and the profound sense of loss that nobody really cares about bagels anymore. This week, I want to talk about dealing with conspiracy theorists, but first, I want to let you know that my audiobook is out everywhere you get audiobooks. If you're an Audible subscriber, it would be great if you chose Dragged Into the Light this month. Also, if you've already read the book and are interested, please consider subscribing to my newsletter at abagelmanifesto.com. I'm doing an audio commentary track that will be out in April exclusively on Patreon, and when that comes out, the details will be there. All right, let's get into this. Speaking of dragged into the light, I stalked members of Sherry Schreiner's conspiracy cult online for the better part of a year, and I can't tell you how depressing it was. It wasn't the obvious stuff that bothered me, the bigotry and the unlimited hatred that seems to fuel people on the fringe, although that was tough to be reminded of. What got me was their interactions with one another, which contained a desperation to be heard that isn't radically different from my own. We all want what we say to affect our larger community. We want to be heard and respected for our insight and cleverness. What saddened me was the complete lack of capacity to connect personally on their part. Most of the group communicated almost exclusively in memes or quotes or factoids. Rarely was there any of them in their interactions, as if they were above the truly personal. I don't have anything nice to say about meme culture generally. It isn't just the staggering lack of originality so much as the needlessness of it. The idea of asking the internet for a clever thing to say that has already been said a million times is an intellectual surrender I really don't like to dwell on. Even beyond that, though, with Sherry's people was a dumbfounding lack of discernment. At first, and even second blush, many of Sherry's followers were demonstrably stupid. Like real stupid people in real life. Dumb people. Stupid is a loaded word. I wasn't allowed to use it growing up, and I think for good reason but it is the word that I want here. It gets at the sense of entitlement to a thick, low ignorance and a pride in that entitlement. Ignorance, which is too much maligned, just means not knowing. There's nothing wrong with that. I've said lots of times and in lots of places, the world would be so much better if it was okay to say, you know what, I don't know. You don't need an excuse for not knowing something. There's no shame in ignorance. Stupid is clinging to the right to be ignorant, to be overwhelmed into giving up rather than trying to figure something out. A stupid person nods yes as you realize they don't have a clue what you're talking about and are tottering off to do whatever they've decided, you said. That's what really got me. Shrinerites based so much of their lives on a distorted understanding of how the world worked. They'd have conversations about quantum physics that I, a relative ignoramus on the subject, was embarrassed to read. It is stupid not to realize when you're ignorant of something, I guess is the way I want to say it. I'm not going to lie. I spent the first month laughing at them. It's an unpleasant feeling, but nearly impossible to resist. I think a lot of us get a sick superiority pleasure in the presence of people who refuse to wonder what they don't know, as if we want to take the person by the shoulders and shake them while yelling, I am so much better than you. On the flip side, I guess that's why they don't care about me and my stupid opinions. And that's the attitude I wanted to try to overcome after I came across the video of a song to Sherry Schreiner. In it, a middle-aged man with thin, mousy hair, I'll call him John, addresses the camera over the top of his keyboard organ as he explains that he's composed a song for Sherry set to the tune of the Daniel Boone television theme. After his introduction, he strikes up the organ and begins singing. It goes like this. Sherry Schreiner has a plan. Yes, a big plan. With a brother who's an eagle, she's as bold as a warrior can be. Honestly, his voice was marginally better than mine. Um, And the eagle, for what it's worth, is supposed to be Jesus. It hurt me to watch. I was embarrassed for his unselfconscious enthusiasm, so I sent it around to a couple people who knew I was working on the story. I wanted them to be complicit, to be impressed that I found this gem that was too cringeworthy for the office, and to know that I was working on something so kooky. It gave me an excuse to stop being empathetic, which I think we can all admit can be something of a relief. I'd play the song for you, but since I first wrote about it maybe two years ago by now, the author has taken it down. 
when I found that out, I felt a pang of guilt, as if like I'd hurt John's feelings. I know it feels bad to be laughed at when you're being serious, when people take your art for buffoonery. It's something I associate with the embarrassment a young child has when they accidentally elicit laughter from the grown-ups. That's when they learn that they're being cute when they're trying to be serious and that it's not a nice feeling. As we become grown-ups, we learn to hedge our bets when we want to be earnest. And when people are unapologetically earnest, sometimes it makes us a little uncomfortable. Maybe that's why memes hold so much appeal. They let us succeed in being clever without having to hold ourselves up for potential ridicule. What I want to figure out is why it makes me happy to laugh at desperate, lonely people struggling for attention and acceptance. That's the big one, right? I'm sure part of it is primal, reinforcing whatever I believe as somehow more right because a person I disagree with is so laughably wrong. That doesn't really hold up, though. I think a better way to put it might be that the more people I can get to laugh at him, the more right those of us who are laughing must be. That's pretty ugly. I mean, if we really are that much more right, why do we care? At the bottom of it is this win-lose mentality that's crept into regular life. Winners are right, losers are wrong. If you lose an argument, say, for many people that means you were wrong. But we all know that's not true. People who have the facts and even history on their side don't necessarily win every argument. It hasn't gotten any better as the notion of facts and even cogency have begun to fade from public life. But what about people who know they may be perceived as losers? For them, being wrong is being a loser, and it's something that they're not capable of contending with. I think the easiest thing to do is to stay stupid, to pointedly not accept that you might be ignorant of something. I was fortunate to learn a lesson about myself in college. I discovered that when I get mad about a criticism of my writing, that criticism is legitimate. If the criticism doesn't bother me, it isn't. It's a mechanism I developed the long, embarrassingly painful way. You see, I hate having been wrong more than almost anything else because I hate having to admit that I was wrong. It's a weird part of my self-image. I'm the kind of person who owns up. The only thing I hate more is when other people won't do the same thing. That I haven't been able to convince people that there's merit in admitting being wrong is one of my great failures. It demoralizes me when other people choose a reality to suit their own private truths and won't be moved. Intellectually, I know that I'm not in charge of making them less stupid, but in my experience, very few people are happy with their private truths unless they can force other people to acknowledge or even live by them. I think it comes from this very democratic notion that if you can get support from enough people, you're probably right. The problem is that when you don't have the capacity to change your mind or to admit that you're wrong, all that's left is to make sure that you win. Get enough people on your side and you all can convince yourselves that your beliefs are true. It's essential to be part of the crowd when you don't have the courage of your convictions. I feel like badgering or ostracizing people until they agree probably isn't a great answer. But I don't know what I would do with a magic wand if waving it could reconcile all of these communities built on incompatible facts. For now, the best I can do is try and take people at their word when they say they believe something, even when it's bonkers. I tried to talk to John, the guy who made the video, but he didn't respond to my messages. Still, from the few videos I saw that he posted, I was able to get a deeper sense of how seriously Sherry's followers took the notion that she was speaking for God. It gave me a sense of how critical that belief was. If Sherry didn't speak for God, John was just a pathetic loser turning TV show theme songs into odes to some shyster. That was a big lesson for me. None of us want to be pathetic, and most of us will go to extreme lengths to convince ourselves that we aren't, that the people who are mocking us are wrong, that in fact they are the losers for refusing to see the truth and admit that they were wrong the whole time. So what do you think? Even though I've been the only one talking for a while, I'd love to get your impression. You can shoot me an email at bytonyrusso at gmail.com. If you want to attach a voice memo, I'd be happy to replay it and comment on it. You can support me and the show by buying my book, Dragged Into the Light. It's available everywhere you get books, and as I mentioned, the audiobook is out. 
If you're willing to review the audiobook, shoot me an email at bytonyrusso at gmail.com and I'll get you a review copy and I'm sure you'll love it. You can also sign up for the newsletter at abagelmanifesto.com or follow me on social media at bytonyrusso on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. The show was written and produced by me, Tony Russo. Keep the faith.